providing as much information as the receiver can handle. Receivers can encourage clear communication by providing clear, timely, descriptive, and non-judgmental feedback. For example, the receiver can shake his slash her hand up and down to confirm, yes, so, so, I have a question. Next. Sino nag raise ng hand? Now we go to the forms of communication. Next. Verbal communication. Verbal communication occurs when we engage in speaking with others. It can be face-to-face, -face, over the telephone, via Skype or Zoom, or etc. Some verbal engagements are informal, such as chatting with a friend over coffee or in the office kitchen, while others are more formal, such as scheduled meeting. Regardless of the type, it is not up, it's not just about the words. It's also about the caliber and complexity of those words, how we string those words together to create an over arcing message as well as the intonation used while speaking. And when occurring face-to-face, -face, while the words are important, they cannot be separated from nonverbal communication. Thanks. Nonverbal communication. What while we do, we speak often says more than the actual words. Nonverbal communication includes facial expressions, posture, eye contact, hand movements, and touch. For example, if you're engaged in a conversation with your boss about your cost-saving idea, it is important to pay attention to both the, to both their words and their nonverbal communication. Your boss might be in agreement with your idea verbally, but their nonverbal cues, avoiding eye contact, sighing, scrunched up face, etc., indicate something is different. Next. Written communication, whether it is an email, a memo, a report, a Facebook post, a tweet, a contract, or more, all forms of written communication have the same goal to disseminate information in a clear and concise manner, though the objective is often not achieved. In fact, poor writing skills often lead to confusion and embarrassment, and even potential legal jeopardy. One important thing to remember about written communication, especially in the digital age, is the message lives on, perhaps in perpetuity. Thus, there are two things to remember. First, write well. Poorly constructed sentences and careless errors make you look bad. And second, ensure the content of the message is something you want to promote or be associated with for the long run. Next. Visual communication. We are a visual society. Think about it. Televisions are, 20, are running 24-7. Facebook is visual with memes, videos, images, etc. Instagram is an image-only platform and advertisers use imagery to sell products and ideas. Think about from a personal perspective, the image we post on social media are meant to convey meaning, to communicate a message. In some cases, the message might be, look at me, I'm an, an Italian, or I just won an award. Others are carefully curated to tug on our heartstrings, injured animals, crying children, etc. That is our next presenter, please. We will now discuss 7.2, the barriers to communication and how to overcome them. Next slide, please. Communication barriers are the factors that disrupt interpersonal communication, causing it to become ineffective. These barriers prevent us from correctly receiving information, ideas, and thoughts being communicated to us. In short, communication barriers lead to unsuccessful communication and misunderstandings. Next slide, please. There are different types of communication barriers, some of which can be controlled by those involved in the conversation, and some that occur naturally and cannot be controlled. In this presentation, we will discuss the common barriers to effective communication. Next slide. First is the language barrier, which occurs due to language differences. Since there are many languages spoken in the world, there will be times when people will not be able to understand each other because they know how to speak in completely different languages. Even though English is considered to be a universal language, a lot of people are not fluent in English or cannot speak it at all, and that is a big challenge. Furthermore, it is still also considered as a language barrier even if both communicators speak the same language, but they have differences in accents or dialects, which may cause misunderstandings. Next is the cultural barrier, which is caused by culture differences. Different cultures have different ways of communicating, such as through their gestures and the symbols that they use. Some cultures may interpret certain words, symbols, or gestures differently than other cultures, and this can lead to misunderstandings. Next is the psychological barrier. This is a major factor in miscommunication. It stems from human emotions, generally the psychological condition of those involved in the conversation. 
Sometimes we let our emotions get the best of us, causing us to interpret things differently or say things that we do not intend to say. Emotional stability greatly affects decision making and judgment, so it is important to keep our mental stealth, mental health in check in order to achieve effective communication. Next slide, please. The physio physiological barrier happens due to the physical state of a sender or receiver's body. This could be through speech impediments or hearing difficulties or medical conditions that may cause miscommunication. This is different to the next one, which is the physical barrier that involves a physical object or sound that disrupts communication, like in the picture shown here of a wall between two people. Noisy surroundings are also considered as physical barriers. Last is the perception barrier, which is caused by personal differences in perceiving information or messages. The example shown on the picture here is a glass filled to the middle. Some people may perceive it as a glass that is half empty or half full. There doesn't mean that either one is wrong. However, there are situations where people do not realize this and that causes miscommunication. Next slide, please. Now that we have discussed the most common types of communication barriers, we will now move on to overcoming them. Here are some helpful tips to ensure effective communication. Next slide. Number one, use the appropriate language and tone. The message should be constructed in a way that is suitable for the situation. We cannot speak in an informal tone in a professional setting, the same way that it would not sound normal to speak corporately in a family gathering. Language and tone matters a great deal. Next, be aware of body language. It is not engaging to speak with someone who is less expressive than a robot. Body language speaks as loud as words. And it is very helpful when appropriate body language matches what is being said verbally. Third, make sure that the message you are trying to convey is clear and consistent. Aim to use words that will be easily understood and avoid contradictions in your statements so that there will be no confusion. Next slide, please. The fourth tip is to choose the best time to convey your message. Timing is important in getting the most out of the conversation. There will be moments where the receiver of the message will not be in the right condition to respond. So timing is really important. Next, be certain to receive punctual and proper feedback. Getting feedback allows you to answer questions and clarifications from the receiver about your message. This way, you will be able to prevent miscommunication by making sure that the receiver has understood the message. Last is to always listen. Communication is a two-way process. It cannot be that only one person is doing all the talking. Listening provides an opportunity to broaden your mind because you will be exposed to different points of views from the people you are communicating with. After all, the best way to listen, the best way to learn is to listen. That is all from my part. Let us now let us now proceed to the next presenter. Uh, now we will be discussing the techniques for communication in organization. These techniques are downward communication, upward communication, and horizontal communication. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, downward communication. It occurs when information and messages flow down through an organizational formal chain of command. In other words, Messages and orders start at the upper levels of the organizational hierarchy and move down towards the bottom levels. Responses to downward communications move up along the same path. Next slide, please. Downward communication provides certain advantages to an organization. Organizational discipline. Downward communication follows the organization organization's hierarchy, meaning that organizational discipline and member compliance is much easier to maintain. Efficiency. Downward communication offers efficiencies because instructions and information come from the sources in power that are able to coordinate activities. From the top of the organization, Employees receive feedback from the supervisors who manage them. Effective communication of goals. 
upper management can easily communicate goals and assign responsibilities regarding achieving those goals. Ease of delegation. Delegation is much easier if the delegation comes directly from the vertical communication structure representing the chain of command. Next slide, please. Downward communication is not without disadvantages, including the following. Distortion. Downward communication can be distorted as it proceeds through multiple levels of organization. Slow feedback. It takes time for messages to go down the organization and then up to the organization and then back down again. This means that feedback can be slow, resulting in problems, especially in a dynamic environment. Interpretative problems. Downward communication presents interpretation problems because of the distortion effect and the slow feedback for message clarification. Lowers morale. Given the time communication takes and the problem with distorted messages, downward communication can have a negative impact on organizational morale. Not motivating. Given slow feedback and the dependence on formal channels of communication, this method of communication doesn't really help with motivation. Next presenter, please. Upward communication. Upward communication is the process by which lower level company employees can di directly communicate with upper management to provide feedback, complaints or suggestions regarding to day-to-day -day operations of the company. Upward communication is increasing in popularity among organizations to encourage a participating work culture. Companies that foster upward communications are better able to make decisions that positively impact their employees. Next slide, please. Now, here are some of the advantages of upward communication in an organization. One is mutual trust. Um, Upward communication can still insist in sense of mutual trust between upward management, lower management, and employees. Next is improves workplace procedure. Using upward communication creates the opportunity for improvements to workplace procedures and consequently workplace productivity. Next is help ma managers identify areas for self-improvement. Managers need to strive to improve just as their employees do, making upward communication a constructive mode for employee to employer feedback. Um, next is makes employees feel valued. Valued. Upward communication encourages employees to communicate directly with upper management. And last is creates an inclusive environment within a, an organization. Integrating upward communication practices into a business can help create an incl inclusive environment. Next slide, please. Now, for the disadvantage of upward communication in an organization versus resistance from employees. Employees rarely initiate upward communication as they are afraid of being ignored. Such communication often meets with improper recognition, so they hesitate to initiate it again. Second is the fear of incompetence. The subor subordinates communicating with the superior sphere that their colleagues or work may regarded by their superior as a reflection on their competence. Next is in the indecisive superiors. If the su superiors do not take any decisions in the light of upward communication, the employees lose confidence in their superiors. Next, message not heard. Often messages do not travel upwards. They're merely rest with the inactive or indifferent superiors. Some managers are poor listeners. Some he simply hear message without taking action, which is why message is not heard. Lastly, is unwillingness to admit failure. Many employees in lower hierarchy are insecure about their jobs and uncertain about their future prospects. They therefore feel unwilling to discuss their on-the-job problems with the superior. Next slide, please. Now we will tackle the horizontal communication. Horizontal communication is the process of knowledge exchanged across employees, departments, and divisions at the same level of the company, also known as the lateral communication. By enabling sharing this sharing, 
this kind of cooperation enables personnel from several departments to work together. Um, organization use horizontal communication to help make better decisions. For instance, when two teams of software developers are working to develop a new product, they may rely on horizontal communication to find out which feature the user would prefer. Next slide, please. Now, for the advantage of horizontal communication in an organization, one is decreases misunderstanding between departments because it may result in better implementation of top-level decisions because employees on lower levels are per permitted to coordinate directly with each other in the implementation of the decision made at the top, thereby increasing efficiency and productivity. To facilitate teamwork, if a project calls for contributions from various individual or divisions, by fostering greater employee communication empowerment, it may also improve job, job satisfaction and motivation. There is coordination because departments and groups are used to organize organizational activities in order for an, for an organization to achieve its ultimate goal. Horizontal communication facilitates coordination of various de, de, department activities. What is gaining benefits of informational communication? Even though it is informal in nature, horizontal communication benefits from some degree in informality and information exchange because the sender and the receiver are in the same position, status, and level of honor. And last is performing independent interdepartmental communication because people in different departments who are in the same level interact horizontally. As a result, communication between the departments runs smoothly. Next slide, please. Some of the part disadvantage of upward communication in an organization. First is maintaining control. As horizontal communication grows, management may struggle more to keep control. This is due in part to the fact that management may gain a great deal of influence and power by managing the flow of information. Next is conflict between employees. Employees exposed to one another through the communication process that can clash as a result of horizontal communication. Additionally, it takes extra time if vertical communication is necessary to validate judgment made during horizontal communication or to verify data obtained during horizontal communication. If stringent procedural norms for communication are not, not established and followed, it could lead to a lack of discipline. Third is rival in attitude. People who are at the same rank and positioning as one another engage in horizontal communication. Uh, they won't normally share knowledge if there is animosity or competition between them. Additionally, they will forcefully withhold facts in order to prevent someone from learning the true story. Or is ignoring vertical communication. Top managers may oppose horizontal communication because they believe it could lead to employees becoming too friendly with one another and posing danger to the management. And lastly, discouraging attitude of top management. More concentration or horizontal communication may work as a substitute of upward and downward communication. In that case, upward and downward communication are in, are identical. Next slide, please. Next, we will discuss 7.4, which is the MIS or Management Information System. Here we will also discuss the MIS design, but first let us define what is MIS or Management Information System. MIS is a computerized database, database wherein financial, administrative, and programmatic information were organized. Moreover, it also studies people, technology, organizations, and their relation to one another. It is also programmed in such a way that it generates regular reports on operations for every level of management. MIS also helps monitor the members of the organization regarding their performance. This way, the higher management can provide feedbacks based on their performance. MIS 
also shows actual data instead of planned results. Therefore, it measures progress instead of goals. Next is, we will be discussing the stages or phases in designing a MIS. First is, the first stage is the problem investigation or problem identification. This is also known as the initial phase of MIS design. It involves identifying the root cause of the MIS. In this phase, it includes gathering requirements and thinking of the possible solutions of a problem. After identifying the necessities, the designing process starts. The main objective of this phase or stage is to conduct feasibility study to develop the proposed MIS. That's why it is also called the pre preliminary study of MIS design. The second one is analysis. An analysis is a detailed inquiry about a particular problem. It also shows the answers to possible questions like what, why, when, and how. It is also a systematic study of a system wherein the components of the system are identified and analyze their interrelationship. The third stage is the design. The design is a sketch or blueprint of a proposed system. It describes the components involved in the system and their relationships. It also describes the interdependency between the components of the system in detail through graphical methods. And there are two types of designs, which is the logical design, which describes the abstract of a system where it deals with defining the types of information needed. It is also similar to a conceptual design where it shows the relationships between the components. And the second category is the physical design, where which it shows the actual input process and out and output processes of the system. It focuses on how data is entered into a system, verified, processed, and displayed as output. The fourth one is the implementation stage, also, which is also known as which is also a stage where the work will be executed. In this phase, the work will be implemented systematically to the components involved in the system. In other words, the work stage starts in the implementation stage. The work is implemented in a systematic manner so that all of the objectives of the system will be fulfilled. And, the, and for the last stage is the maintenance stage, which is also known as the monitoring stage. This is the phase where the designers of the MIS will be able to maintain the MIS running for a long period of time. Moreover, the MIS can be updated to improve the organization's operations. Next presenter, please. Right. Okay, so the purpose of MIS, uh, there are three purposes, and one of them is back. It it is a backbone of an or organization's operations. Um, MIS is used for decision making, and for data coordination, control, analysis, and visualization of information. MIS also improves, well, decision making. It providing up-to-date, accurate data on a variety of organizational assets, such as financials, inventory, personnel, project timelines, manufacturing, real estate, marketing, and raw materials. Lastly, with the help of NMIS, it strategizes ways to improve those operations because, well, the goal of an MIS is to be able to correlate multiple data points in order to strategize ways to improve the operation. Uh, an example of this is being able to compare sales this month to sales a year ago. 
by looking at staffing levels may point to ways to boost revenue or being able to compare marketing expeditions by geographic location and link them to sales can also improve decision making but the only way this level of analysis is possible is due to data and that data is compiled through an mis um running reports that pull together disparate data is an mis key contribution although that feature comes with a significant cost with the help of mis implementation uh, it is an investment that includes the hardware and software purchases as well as the integration between and training of all employees um next slide next slide please that will be all and thank you for listening and have a pleasant day everyone